My name is Anjali. I'm a software engineer at Google. And uh, just a little bit about me before I get started. Um, I'm, on, I'm part of a group called the Google Brain. The way I always describe our team is that we kind of do all things machine learning. So some people work on research and machine learning. Some people build software for machine learning called TensorFlow. Some people work on applications of machine learning around Google. I personally am kind of most interested in the boundary between research and applications, particularly um, any problems that require language understanding. So um, that's exactly what I'm going to tell you about today, which is how we can apply machine learning to problems in language understanding. And I'm not going to talk specifically about uh, virtual assistants, but I think that um, understanding language, and more specifically understanding dialogue, is sort of a fundamental capability that we expect of virtual assistants, right? If we imagine the ideal virtual assistant, we're speaking with it in our language, you know, in natural human language, whether it's English or Spanish or whatever language we speak. And you know, one way to achieve this would be to have kind of a very handcrafted grammar where you know, we predefine this grammar and then when we speak to the assistant, we make sure to speak only in the vocabulary it knows, only with this sequence of commands it knows. And when it responds, it builds up a command from this handcrafted grammar. What I want to talk about is a very different approach, which is end-to-end -end machine learning completely from data. Um, so to uh, describe this approach, or to kind of give you an example of this approach, I am going to be talking about the Smart Reply project that I recently worked on. So um, in case you haven't heard of Smart Reply, uh, here's, here's kind of the intuition for the feature. The idea was, um, take a look at this email. It says, can you do Tuesday or Wednesday? Now even though you didn't receive this email, you could probably think of a few plausible responses, right? Tuesday, Wednesday, neither one. So what happened was some Gmail engineers looked at this problem and they said, well, if the words in the email can be used for us to predict a response, why can't the computer do that? We want to surface these responses Tuesday and Wednesday to the user. And the idea is that they could just tap one and then send it. And you know, it saves them some time and frustration of typing on their mobile phone. Now, in this case, it might seem pretty easy. Tuesday and Wednesday are both in the email. There's a really simple way to just pull them out. But think about like. The, all the different types of emails you send and receive, and they can be short and they can be long, and some are formal and informal and all different types of scenarios. So to do this in the more general case, we really needed a system that could both understand the contents of the email and then generate language to go back. Um, so what we're talking about is a system that truly understands and actually participates in a dialogue. Moreover, we need something that's robust to all the different types of styles and different content that you would encounter in the world's email. Um, so this, needless to say, this really pushed the limits of what we could do in terms of machines understanding language. But the approach we took, I think, really well demonstrates the concept of end-to-end -end learning completely from data. So I'm going to spend the next uh, eight to 10 minutes telling you a little bit more about the model. I'm going to dive into some technical details. Um, and I apologize, it's going to go pretty quickly, but you can just ask me more questions later. Uh, during coffee breaks and, and whatnot, if, if anything is unclear. OK, so for this project, the model we built, um, so basically the, the problem is smart reply feature gets an email coming in, then has to compose an email going out. So it's pretty simple, email in, email out. The model we built uh, was a neural network, also known as a deep learning model. And given that there's a deep learning summit going on downstairs, I'm guessing that by now all of you have heard of neural networks. Um, but I'm just going to give a really quick refresher, just in case. Um, so the basic building block of the neural network is the neuron. The job of the neuron is that it is just supposed to learn some little useful function of some data. So the x's are the inputs, the w's are the weights. And it's just learning these w's, these parameters, to compute some function of the x's that then it sends out. When you compose, oops, when you compose a bunch of these neurons, you get a neural network. And the neural network is a very powerful class of function approximators. Um, so probably you're all, if you've heard of neural networks, you've probably seen this one before. The input to this neural network is an image. It's just the pixels of this image and the images of a handwritten digit. And the output is what digit is it? Okay, so how do we learn all those weights to predict what the output uh, class label is? Well, the idea is that you just give the neural network uh, many, many examples of images and their labels. And then each example it reads in, it computes what it thinks is the right answer, it looks at what the actual right answer is, and then it just tweaks all of its weights a little bit to move a little bit closer to the right answer. 
Um, so that's kind of what this, this is showing. You're kind of like moving, moving down along the curve. That's gradient descent. It's vast oversimplification. Um, OK, so, so the idea is you can learn it completely just from seeing the example in the data. But now coming back to our problem, I told you the input is an email and the output is an email. So that's a little bit different from what I just showed you, right? The traditional classic feed-forward neural network, there's a few reasons that's not going to adapt to this problem, right? One, the input to our network is words, not an image. Two, it's a whole sequence of words, not just one static. And three, the output is also a sequence of words. So I'm going to just... Uh, each one of these uh, issues could be a talk in itself, but I'm just going to quickly run through at a high level each one of these kind of the high level idea of how um, in uh, machine learning we address each of these challenges. So first, the neural network likes to think in terms of um, fixed dimensional real valued vectors. So with an image, it's just the pixel values of the image. But a lot of types of inputs don't fit into that category. So with things like words, in this case, what we do is we learn what's called an embedding function that's going to take the word and map it into this fixed dimensional uh, floating point vector space. So we might, we'll just choose a dimensionality, maybe it's like 100 dimensions, um, and we're going to map each word into this 100 dimensional space. Um, and I, I don't have time to go into details, but uh, the idea is that um, uh, the embedding function that we design is, is still going to be differentiable. So we can still do what I described before in terms of learning the embedding function the same way we learn all the other weights. Because we can still compute the derivatives, we can still update all the weights at each step to get a little closer to what we want. And over time, the neural network, after seeing many, many examples, will learn the best embedding, or will, will attempt to learn the best embedding function for the problem. And so it'll learn things like very similar words should be very close in vector space. So great and fantastic should be really close. And then whether your email says, I'm great or I'm fantastic, the neural network kind of knows you mean the same thing. So that's just a very high level view of how we deal with words. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into too much detail there. The second issue I said was how do we deal with a whole sequence as opposed to just one static input? Well, for this, uh, we use what's called the recurrent neural network. The idea of a recurrent neural network is instead of just getting one input and giving one output, there's an internal state that persists across this, the sequence of inputs. So we get one input, and the neural network updates its internal state. And by state, I, again, I'm just talking about a real-valued vector. Again, the neural network likes to think in terms of fixed-dimensional vectors. So the idea is that, for, for example, if there was a sequence of words, Let's just say we have this simple email that says, that is good. The network gets one word as input in the same way I described with the embedding function. The embedding function maps that word into a vector space. It takes that vector, then through some major multiplications, incorporates it into its state. And now its internal state is kind of updated to represent this word. Then it receives the next word, and it updates its internal state again, and the next word, and the next word. And so the idea is that each step it's got this internal state that's persisting, and it's just updating to take in kind of its new information. The idea is that by the time it's seen the whole email, its internal state, we kind of think of as an encoding of the whole email it's seen. It's kind of a representation of that whole sequence that it's seen. And you know, this, this could apply to other types of sequences, too. OK, so the third issue that I mentioned is how are we going to predict a sequence of words? Well, basically, what we're going to do is, after we've read in the whole email, we're then going to feed the neural network sort of a special symbol, which I've just represented by a blank line here. But this special symbol basically is just a signal to the neural network that says, OK, you're done reading the original message. It's time to generate the response message. It's just sort of like a, a special token that tells it to kind of like switch gears. And then we can fetch the output from it and interpret that as a word. And then we're basically going to do what we did before, but just in reverse, which means we take that word and then feed it back into the neural network, basically telling it what it just told us. And then it updates its state and outputs another word. And we feed that back in, and then updates its state and outputs another word. So um, this, this overall idea of uh, putting, these, uh, putting this, um, uh, this, this whole uh, framework is called sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning. It's also called RNN encoder-decoder models. Um, and it was, it's, uh, there's a lot of work in the field on this. The paper I've just mentioned here is from Ilya Sutskiver and all. Um, but putting this all together uh, in our context, basically we take the, the incoming email, we read it one token at a time, so how are you, 
And then our network kind of has this internal representation of how are you. We feed it the special symbol, and then we fetch the first word, it says I, we feed that back in, we fetch the next word, it says am, we feed that back in, and that uh, is basically how we generate the outgoing message. Um, so I'm going to move on in a second to kind of how um, this works in practice. But the key thing, I know I just went over kind of a lot really quickly, and I didn't have time to go into details, but the key point I really just wanted to make here is that everything is learned from data. Basically, we, we take a historical corpus of email, and we uh, feed many, many examples like this into the model, and over time, the model learns um, what kind of responses make the most sense with what types of original messages. And there's no handcrafted features. There's nothing even to do with pause tagging or syntax. Everything is just learned from the data end-to-end uh, -end by the network. OK, so um, this model can be used completely generatively. What that means is that we can take any email and feed it in, and it can generate a ranked list of what it believes to be the best response emails. So um, this is just an example that I pulled that uh, uses the same email um, from the beginning of my talk, can you do Tuesday or Wednesday? And as you can see, the examples are things like, I can do Tuesday, I can do Wednesday, Tuesday works for me, Wednesday works for me. And so not only are these all kind of plausible and make sense in this context, um, but they're all grammatically correct, even though, as I said, there's, there's no extra grammar features or anything included in here. It just learns that from the data, kind of what makes sense as a sentence. Um, yeah, I guess I'm running short on time, so I have to skip a few slides. Uh, so this is launched. It, it's launched in Inbox by Gmail. Um, it's now used um, to compose over 10% of mobile replies in Inbox. Over 10% of these replies use the assistance of this feature. And basically what we do is we, we just use the model generally as I just demonstrated. Um, there's some filtering for diversity. There is whitelisting. And then we show the best three options uh, to the user. So this is just an example of an email I received from the organizer of this conference. Um, asking me to send an abstract and a bio, and the responses are, here you are, working on it now, and I will have it to you this afternoon. Uh, all right, so to um, wrap up, I guess I already said that, yeah. Uh, to wrap up, um, I just wanted to reiterate again that um, you know this, this type of model, this sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, um, in this case, we've shown that it uh, can generate plausible email replies in, in many scenarios. It learns end-to-end -end from data, um, and it is launched and it is being used. Um, but but kind of more importantly, I wanted to step back from Smart Reply and just talk more generally about uh, language understanding. I think that this, um, this very data-driven approach um, is very promising for language understanding. After we launched Smart Reply, um, some, sometime later, uh, Google also started to use a very similar model um, for Google Translate, um, which is also a language understanding problem. And so I think this type of model in general has shown that it's very powerful for language understanding. Um, and so, you know, specifically for virtual assistants, we, we could find this kind of approach to be complementary to some of the um, kind of like handcrafted scenarios and rules. These approaches might work well together. Um, so just wrapping up, I just wanted to mention um, that, of course, this project involved the work of many, many people, um, some of my fellow researchers on the brain team, and also many, many people on the Gmail team. I just wanted to mention here the people that I work most closely with. Um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>